Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bible, if you would, and join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In just a moment, we'll be in that passage, 1 Corinthians 15. Do you know, a lot of times we use words and unless we have some sense of the nuance of the word, it could take us in a, in a direction that maybe the speaker was not intending it to take. For example, the word finished, finished. There are some ideas behind the word that, that at times need some further definition, further explanation. For example, a building, we could say, well, the building is finished, but that would be different from a person whose political career is now finished. For one, that means the conclusion of something, but for the other, the building, it means the very beginning of the same. Finished, someone who has prepared a beautiful dinner and all the details and all the things that accompany it. They may even look and say, good, I'm finished, but Actually, upon their completion, we actually begin to enjoy that which is finished. College. There, there's something about college that when we finally say, hey, I'm finished, we, we mark the completion of college with another word. We, we call that commencement. And so the idea of finished and beginning actually meet together. Finished. Death. There is certainly some finality to death, but in reality, it is not over. This life is finished, but it has the potential to, at the point of death, truly begin. The last recorded words of Christ on the cross in the book of John in John's gospel, the last words that he records of Jesus speaking were found in John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. Some may conclude then that nothing else is necessary. Christ just announced it is finished. So, so, so nothing else is needed, everything is done. What we can say is the price of our salvation has been fully paid, finished. There's nothing left that need be added. But if Christ's existence concludes with it is finished, then I will tell you quite plainly, so then is your hope and mine. There is something that takes us beyond the finish of the cross and what we might truly say is when Christ said it is finished, something then was still lacking. And that is what happened three days later. And that is the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why is this resurrection so significant? Because without it, you and I genuinely have no faith different from any other. Without the bodily, literal resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave, salvation could not have been provided. And I might add, without belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, salvation cannot be received. The Bible says it very plainly, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What's an important part of this whole picture of salvation? And that is belief in the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
So let's take some time today and let's look at what it means that the work of Christ is finished, but not over. Okay, let's start with something that we will call foundational. And that is the foundation of our faith is finished, but it's not over. Okay, foundations. Remember, when any structure is being constructed, there is something vitally important about the foundation. Have you ever, um, have you ever seen people who know the construction lingo? Now, I don't, I'm not really around it, but I have heard people say, use expressions like this. They've said, okay, hey, we're finally ready to go vertical. That comes after all of the preparation of going deep. And I might add that the, the higher the structure, the more important the depth of the foundation. So foundation, you remember that, that Jesus was teaching about his own teachings. And he said, the wise man built his house upon the rock, upon a solid foundation, the foolish man upon the sand. Well, is your foundation for your faith, is it built upon the rock and is it including the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Your Bibles are open right now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's start in verse number 14. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 14. Now consider the foundation of our faith. It's finished, but it's not over. And think about how crucial a resurrected Christ is to our foundation. Verse number 14, 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Do you know the, the word vain is a simple word to define? It simply means empty. And do you know what the Apostle Paul says regarding our faith? He said, if Christ be not risen from the dead, then your faith is empty. It may have the trappings of faith, it may appear to be some faith, but he's just telling us straight up, it is no faith if Christ be not risen from the dead. Now, some people want to say, well, it's fine. Listen, just go ahead and believe that, that your faith is good and that it works for you. And, and it really doesn't matter if the resurrection happened. What's most important is that you just believe that it did. Do you know Jesus Christ and his resurrection it is foundational to all that we believe. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And that includes his substitutionary death, his burial, and his literal resurrection from the grave. Do you know the first thing that we see is the, the foundation of our faith. It is finished, but not over. Now, where does that lead us to? That leads us next to the fact of our faith. Finished, but not over. The fact of our faith. Our faith has a foundation, and that foundation is only as good as that which it's built upon. It is the fact of the resurrection of Christ. And we must note, a fact is not established simply because you believe it to be so. It is a fact because it actually happened, whether you believe it or not. Okay, your Bibles are still open to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look down at verse number three. So back up just a little bit. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse number, beginning at verse number three. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12. After that, he was seen above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto the present, but some are fallen asleep. 
After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Now, let's consider the fact of Jesus Christ's resurrection. This is something that certainly is finished. The facts are all done, but it has ongoing implications. It's not finished. Okay, so for us to have a resurrection, what do we have to first have? And that is a death. The Bible says that Christ died according to the scriptures. Now there are some, in fact, there were some as early as Paul's day who said, well, how do we know that Christ really died? In fact, I'm not even certain that he did. What we have and what Paul is sharing is, he says, I'm, I'm just sharing you what's been shared with me, what you're gonna share with others. We have something of not just the tradition, but this chain of facts that is bound from one event to the next, to the next. And it ties it to us today, this chain of historical events. And what's one of the things that Christianity has that separates it from all other faiths, all other systems of belief? You and I have something that actually connects the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the death of Jesus Christ prophesied hundreds, even up to a thousand years before. I want you to hold your place in 1 Corinthians 15, but take your Bible, if you would, and join me in two additional passages, the first of which is Isaiah 52. Isaiah chapter 52. Take your Bible and look with me at something that took place. This was 700 years prior to the time of Christ. And I want us, as we read this passage, to think of whom may this passage be speaking? Isaiah 52, let's begin in verse number 13. Here the Bible says this, behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And many were astonished at thee. His visage, his image, was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Okay, now pause right here. If you're thinking in our day today, who might we know whose image was marred beyond that of any man? Now immediately our minds at least begin to take us to Christ and his crucifixion. So let's continue on with Isaiah. Look further now, Isaiah chapter 53. Let's begin in verse number four. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall seal the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities." Now remember, this passage of scripture is written 700 years prior to the time of Christ. And what's it telling us? It's telling us that there is one who is wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. 
the chastisement of our peace is upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. Now, let me ask you, who qualifies for these things to be said about them other than singularly the person of Jesus Christ? Take your Bible and look at one other passage in in this idea, Psalm 22. Psalm chapter 22. Now remember the Isaiah passage written some 700 years before the time of Christ. This passage in Psalm 22 is written by its own admission, its own title, its acknowledgement. It is a Psalm of David. Now as we read some highlights from Psalm 22, I want you to at least ask the question, did, did these things actually happen to David? Or is David writing prophetically about a one who would come some 1,000 years later? Might I even add to this, David's about to write something and give details about something that's not even been practiced yet. Crucifixion is something that had not been practiced in David's day, and yet David begins to write with painstaking detail about crucifixion. Okay, let's see just some of the insights that David gives us regarding the death of Jesus Christ. Psalm 22, beginning in verse number one. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring, from the very opening words of this psalm, we begin to hear someone say what we recognize as the words of Christ on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look at verse number seven. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And we can almost see in our own mind's eye those scorners at the foot of the cross mocking Jesus, saying, he saved others. Let's see if he, by the power of God, can save himself. Verse number 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Look at verse number 16. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now, please consider for a moment, when did any of these things happen to King David? When did David have his body stretched so that all his bones protruded? When did David have his hands and his feet pierced? When did David have his clothes set out before him and lots cast so that the winner could take the prize? When did this happen to David? And the answer is clearly, it did not. And yet there is one that we have presented a thousand years before the event, and that is Jesus Christ. And David is writing about the manner of death of Jesus. This is a literal, real death prophesied throughout Scripture. We we would have to believe some far-fetched thing, in fact, I believe we would have to swallow, accept something far more difficult to believe. That is that Jesus never actually died at his crucifixion. than we would to believe that Jesus arose victorious from a borrowed tomb. Mary Baker Eddy, you may find that name familiar. She's the founder of the Christian science movement. She wrote a blasphemous chapter regarding the atonement of Christ, and she wrote of it being the seeming, seeming death, suggesting that Christ's death was no death at all. What she purported was that Jesus never really died. He was crucified. There's historical accounts of that, but Jesus was just placed in a tomb, and then he revived in the tomb. And he inspired confidence from those his followers. Do you know what you would have to believe 
if Jesus didn't really die his substitutionary death on the cross of Calvary, consider for just a moment, what would we have to accept? We'd have to accept that a Roman soldier in charge of executions left the scene before making certain that Christ was dead. Now I'm telling you, that to me is unthinkable. A man who is tasked with making certain that the prisoners have died. And they go and they inspect all three. When they come to Christ, it is obvious that Christ has died. The Bible says in, in John 19, beginning in verse 33, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. This to anyone who is medically inclined, who understands the human body, knows this in itself is proof enough that Jesus Christ did in fact die on Calvary's cross. But we'd have to go even more. Not only does a Roman executioner not confirm that Jesus has died, how about the enemies of Christ? The Pharisees who have been working for some time now to secure the death of Christ. Do you think that any Pharisee would have said when Christ is still alive, well, I'm, I'm certain he's going to die. I'm going home for now. Or would the Pharisees have absolutely secured the knowledge that Jesus Christ has in fact died on Calvary's cross? The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the angry crowd, all would have wanted proof that Jesus Christ was in fact dead. And then how about this? Not only a Roman executioner, not only the Pharisees, but consider his friends. Have you ever watched someone hope against hope that their loved one had not in fact died and even struggled to accept the same? Maybe a doctor said, I'm sorry, they're gone. And, and their mind can't process it. They find it hard to finally believe, to finally accept news that, that they're gone and they say they can't be gone, they're, they're not gone. No, no, they're not. But in fact, they are. We have the friends of Jesus. They request the body. They are granted permission. They take his body down from a cross. They prepare the body of Jesus. Don't you think that those who stood and watched Jesus die would look for any indication that he was in fact alive? But they prepare his body. They wash it, they wrap it tightly, they anoint it with pounds of spices and they lay the body in a tomb and they watch as the stone is rolled over and the seal is set around the tomb. We would have to believe that, that the Roman executioner didn't confirm the death of Christ. We would have to believe that the Pharisees, the enemies didn't confirm the death of Christ. We would have to believe that Jesus' friends did not confirm the death of Christ. We would have to believe, as some have supposed, that they've called it some swoon theory. Well, Jesus was laid in the cool tomb and, and there Jesus recovered his strength and he simply revived. Do you know what it would take for Jesus to revive in a, in a tomb? What, what would have to be present here? Well, he'd have to remove himself in the pitch black from being bound with the cloths. He would then, in the pitch black, he would have to lay out those cloths that had wrapped him in perfect order, picturing some supernatural resurrection out of those cloths. Then Jesus would have to somehow remove the stone that had been sealed, you know, locking him into the grave. Then Jesus, who had suffered the reality of crucifixion, prior to that had suffered the reality of scourging. Prior to that had suffered the reality of him sweating in Gethsemane 
as it were, great drops of blood. Jesus would have to now walk out of the tomb. Do you know what happens to a human body at the point of crucifixion? When the cross is lifted and it is dropped into the hole for the cross, Jesus' arms, his body, most likely even his legs would be jolted out of joint from the jarring aspect of the cross hitting. He would have to walk now for several miles with feet that had been pierced, with a body that's experienced the loss of blood, with a body that now is suffering severe dehydration. And then not only that, but Jesus would have had to have come into the midst of his disciples, inspiring incredible confidence that he is in fact risen. I don't say this to be in any way, shape or form morbid, but can you imagine if Christ weren't resurrected in a new glorified body, what kind of horrors might others have experienced had Christ somehow managed to escape from his tomb in his post-crucifixion body? It would have been horrifying to say the least. Christian historian Kenneth Scott Latour wrote in his book, History of the Expansion of Christianity, these words. It was the conviction of the resurrection of Jesus which lifted his followers out of the despair into which his death had cast them and which led to the perpetuation of the movement begun by him. But for their profound belief that the crucified had risen from the dead and they had seen him and talked with him, if it hadn't been for that, he said, the death of Jesus and even Jesus himself would probably have been all but forgotten. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying Jesus Christ's resurrection and appearance is the thing that allows Christianity to exist to this very day. And then what is it that we would have to believe? We would have to believe the most ridiculous lie. I won't take time to read the passage, but in Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 through 15, do you remember what happens after the resurrection of Christ? The soldiers hurry back to the Pharisees and they say, he's gone. And they said, he can't be, he's gone. Here's what you do. You say that while you were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body away. Okay, so a, a bunch of fishermen, of course, they couldn't overtake the, uh, the guards that are posted. These, these are, are people that are skilled, obviously, in the art of war. The disciples are not those, all right? So they're not gonna go with their fishing poles and you know, fight the soldiers. So here's what you say. You say that you were sleeping and the disciples came and stole away the body. Can you imagine in a court of law, the judge saying, okay, tell me, what is it that you saw? Uh, well, here's what happened. And you explain the story and he says, okay, now, when did this happen? It happened when I was sleeping. Okay, what's gonna happen to you? Maybe you're gonna be put in jail, okay? Listen, you would have to believe the most ludicrous of stories if you believe that Jesus did not literally come victorious out of the grave, resurrected, having had died on Calvary's cross. Lawyer Sir Edward Clark said this, as a lawyer, I have made a prolonged study of the evidences for the events of the first Easter day. For me, the evidence is conclusive and over and over again in the high court, I have secured the verdict on evidence, not nearly so compelling. Thomas Arnold, he's a renowned historian, author of the famous three volume History of Rome, an appointee to the chair of modern history at Oxford. Listen to what he once wrote. The evidence of our Lord's life and death and resurrection may be and often has been shown to be satisfactory. It is good according to the common rules of distinguishing good evidence from bad. Thousands and tens of thousands of persons have gone through it piece by piece as carefully as every judge summoning up on an important case. 
I have myself done it many times over, not to persuade others, but to satisfy myself. I have been used for many years to study the history of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence of those who have written about them. And I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is better proved by fuller evidence than the great sign that God has given us that Christ died and rose again from the dead. Do you know what you and I have? We have a foundation that is finished, but not over. We have the fact of our faith. It's finished, but not over. And let me summarize in one final verse that the future of our faith is finished. That is secured, but it's not over. The Bible says it this way. Of course, in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, it says, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is vain also. However, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, the Bible says, but now, and I love this word, it's two letters. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Theologian Eric Sauer wrote, the present age is Easter time. It begins with the resurrection of the redeemer and it ends with the resurrection of the redeemed. Do you know what you and I have? We have one who led the way and because Christ died, was buried and rose again, he became the first of many that will follow. Did you know what's gonna to happen to your body someday if Christ doesn't come before you die? Your body is gonna be laid in the ground. Now you're not gonna be there. The Bible says to be absent from your body is to be present with the Lord. But guess what you have to wait for? You have to wait for what we call Christ's appearing. And that is when all who know Christ throughout all the ages, at that moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at a moment's time, your body will be like Christ's glorified body. Okay, now it's just us in here today, but how many of you are a little tired of the body that you have right now? And you know, I, I just think about the reality of these human failing bodies. But do you know what you're gonna get one day? You're gonna get the same kind of body like the one who led the way. Now is Christ risen from the dead and he's become the first fruits. He's become the leader. Listen, I led the way, but there will be many that will follow. The Israelites made an offering. It was the offering of their first fruits. It was important because that first one had to be offered and then so much of the harvest would follow. Christ led the way with his bodily resurrection. Christ forced open the door that had been sealed. And now for all who know him, there is no shutting that door. Christ is risen from the dead. He is the first to rise of thousands who will come after. Yes, my friend, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.